You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast, and I have Dr. Conrad Iber. Uh, he's with the University of Minnesota, and he also uh, does some work with uh, Fairview Sleep Center. Uh, so, Dr. Iber or Conrad, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, so tell me about your work um, at Fairview or perhaps your research. What, what are you working on now in the field of sleep that uh, is of particular interest to you? Well, uh, well, I guess my original work was primarily in uh, causes of interruption of breathing pattern and my earlier in my career, things that caused apneas or cessation of breathing, part of the sleep apnea syndrome, and uh, later worked in uh, some areas of epidemiology. Uh, we have several areas of interest right now. One that's kind of a new area for me are areas of policy, which I find interesting, the opportunities in population management, working in a large, larger healthcare system, and improving population health and, and sleep apnea and other conditions, and then also uh, even in the community, I'm working with public health, the University of Minnesota on a, a school start time um, issue, looking at the impact on adolescent sleep health, specifically obesity, with uh, Rachel Widom and and others, and but also working on. Uh, uh, public health more generally in, in sleep medicine and within the healthcare system. So we've developed some sort of model, if you will, care plans for patients, uh, for instance, with sleep apnea with home and electronic uh, health record integration for about five or six years now. And the the initiative to uh, start school at a different time, can you know, can we, maybe we can start with that. Um, I've heard that the uh, the chronotype for the time that people like to get up, you know, when they're teenagers or maybe even in middle school is different than older folks. What time right now do kids have to report to school and what time do you think it would be more beneficial and why? Yeah, and I think you've pointed on uh, this interesting opportunity in population health to bring together basic sleep science which really started decades ago in understanding that adolescents actually have, by nature, a delay in their sleep schedule. Beginning roughly around the age of 12, pubescence, there is a delay. So um, independent of their tendency to surf the internet and, uh, and study late into the evening is a, perhaps a stronger drive for them to go to bed later and get up later. And uh, so you asked about times, and typically school start times for high schoolers and middle schoolers can can be 7.30. And in fact, across most of the nation in the U.S., that's a common pattern with some changes gradually occurring uh, since the late 1990s. And in some schools, for instance, have delayed school starts as late as uh, 8.30 or even after 9, 9 in the morning, which fits a bit hmm. better with natural sleep schedule. So I find this policy area is very interesting. It's always often a little controversial, but it brings together basic uh, sleep science with impact on uh, public health, which is uh, a real opportunity for those of us who work uh, seeing individual patients and managing specific problems. It's also an opportunity to improve uh, sleep health overall. All right. Well, what, what does that mean, though? So a school starts, you know, 9 or 9.30. Has this been studied? What's been the effect on kids? Do they learn better? You know, how is it quantified? Yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, the outcome data, um, and again, it's, you know, started out sort of anecdotally, but uh, increasingly studies like this are being done where sort of what we call quasi-experimental. Some schools are choosing to change their start time, and so looking at the schools who don't and the schools who do, do we can see changes in outcomes, and they're quite diverse. They're affected by many things that are going on in the schools, but the general changes are kids 
uh, generally perform better uh, when they start later. So there is improvement in academics. Some things we wouldn't normally think about are also happening. Uh, they have less car accidents, particularly in the morning. They're more likely to be alert. And so school districts that delay their start time will generally experience a reduction in car accident rates. Uh, a major cause, of course, for death in teens is uh, accident rates in general and inattentiveness due to sleepiness is a component of that. So um, we see improvement in academic performance. Uh, there's improvements in when children get more sleep improvements in mood may not be obvious, but sleep, uh, I think we all recognize anecdotally that younger kids who don't get sleep are cranky. Uh, what we don't realize that adolescent mental health is substantially affected. Uh, even the impact of school start time can change that. Uh, one study showed that offering children a longer time to sleep uh, by things such as a change in their schedule, in this case school start time, does afford a measurable change in in uh, subjective mood. Uh, mood's a big deal in teens. Fairfax, Virginia uh, looked at their experience with kids not getting sleep. A survey of children who got less than five or six hours of sleep had very high uh, suicide attempts within a year. And so mood changes are pretty important, determined in part by getting adequate sleep. And, and so this is an opportunity to step in to a population and influence a wide variety of outcomes, including safety, weight gain, potentially, and academic uh, improvement, even within athletics and adolescent and young adult safety, at least, in, in, uh, per, and perhaps in performance improves with extending sleep time. So you let me know if I'm going too far on any of these questions. I'm happy to, if you want to interrupt me, because uh, I know you probably have some specific things you'd like to talk about. No, no, this is good. I mean, that's 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 a much more quantified answer that, you know, so there's, there's tons of benefits for it. it what's, has there been a reaction or buy-in from school administrators or parents or kids? I mean, do they like the current uh, start and stop times, or would they prefer something different? Well, I think it's uh, you know it's a big change for a school, and there are some costs involved. Um, often uh, cited costs are the cl the classic one is uh, you know it's going to cost a few million dollars to change our bus schedules. It hasn't really you know it, we can speak locally in the metropolitan area here of Minneapolis St. Paul. Uh, we've had a fair bit of experience looking at this critically for a few decades, and. That just hasn't happened. There are costs involved. Certainly, it's it's a structural change for schools. They often have elementary school kids going a little earlier and then uh, late middle school, high school kids going later. So there's a way to accomplish it, and the costs aren't uh, unmanageable. It's a transition for schools, so there's no doubt transition for parents, too, who you know have to often make a, a difference in the way in which they're managing at home their supervision of, of kids. Having had 14 teens myself, I appreciated having them coming home a, a little later, actually, from school, uh, closer to when I was coming home from work. <laughs> and I think so. Sometimes parents need to look at the potential benefits of the uh, changes in time uh, for their teenagers. Okay, very good. What, um, in terms of your other work, what are you seeing any trends in how people are sleeping or how long or the quality of their sleep? Or you know, what are you seeing overall is happening to people? I think people have become, you know, the surveys done, for instance, by National Sleep Foundation, looking at uh, public's acceptance of um, increasing scrutiny on people like policemen, bus drivers, transportation workers, uh, healthcare workers, on the fact that, uh, that these people need sleep in order to perform better. Uh, there's becoming a general acceptance, I think, in society that we do need to sleep and personal awareness. People are wearing devices to ensure that they're getting sleep. Uh, I think we who practice in the field appreciate this awareness because it makes it a little bit easier on an individual uh, level, you know, counseling patients uh, all the way to improving outcome to have this kind of buy-in. So I think you're pointing out the awareness on a, in a, a probably another level I might mention that we are, implementing more sort of in-home monitoring with wearable devices, for instance, looking for the duration of sleep and uh, increasingly integrating uh, some of the devices we have um, in all fields, not just in sleep medicine, so that we can do more virtual monitoring and support for people. Uh, we started a program here 
in 2013 of integrating uh, devices, literally, you know, every breath is being captured at night with these positive airway pressure devices for sleep apnea or even ventilatory support. And these can be integrated into an electronic health record, which allows then a coordinated care plan for managing patients. And so that's an area of, of population health that I think is also a very exciting, which is uh, the opportunity to do home monitoring um, that may correlate with lots of outcomes, uh, increased in, uh, sleep per se, but disruption of sleep is also not a good thing. There are diseases and aging and medical conditions that disrupt sleep, and that's a, a measurable issue in the home that can be captured on home devices and can be utilized by healthcare providers in optimizing care. Yeah, how would you compare, um, again, doing a sleep study in clinic to uh, any kind of monitoring at home? Are they are they closing the gap, or is it still going to be a while before that's uh, all the same? Well, I think many of us in the field have been doing this for many decades, and uh, yeah, the closing the gap is partly technology and partly our learning what we can and can't do. Can we do kids? Can we do adults? Uh, can we do adults with disease? Can we do younger children? And I think we are pushing the envelope on this and realizing that with uh, not just the technology per se, but the workflows uh, to ensure that we don't lose people in the process uh, with disease or unnecessarily treat people who are being incorrectly classified as having disease. I think that's where we're narrowing the gap. And um, I think it will be uh, wonderful when we're at a point that we can do much more uh, home monitoring uh, for ongoing monitoring of disease management, uh, as well as for diagnostic testing. And there are a lot of opportunities uh, for moving into new areas. Uh, I know uh, some people are working with no-touch methods, of uh, various sorts. Um, they don't yet, I think, have the accuracy or granularity detail that we need for some of our uh, diagnoses, but um, I think we're certainly in the threshold with technology of achieving a lot of that, and the real trick may not just be the technology. The real trick is integrating into a healthcare management strategy that really works well uh, and, and uh, serving the patients at the same time. Uh, correctly classifying them and following them. So what do you see as um, as up and coming in the sleep world over the next, you know, year, two, three years? Any new technology that you're excited about or new initiatives? Yeah, I think already we're seeing uh, quite a bit of um, leveraging uh, virtual methods, and I'm talking about telemedicine methods of various sorts, telemonitoring uh, methods of various sorts, tele, you know, diagnostic uh, monitoring. I think it will be wonderful if we get a better, um, we're not quite there yet, uh, neuropharmacology that allows us to eventually alter sleep schedules better than what we can currently do. We are, I think, failing to meet the needs of the 8 to 12 million shift workers who are burdened by the inability to adapt to changes in schedule. And that population who have higher risk of perhaps uh, controversially of co cognitive problems, but certainly of healthcare risks, of a range of different healthcare risks, and maybe even mortality, we're not serving that population. They may not be performing very well in their work. And if we had better methods identifying people with better resilience based on their genetics or performance, guiding them into proper schedules and, and neuro pharmacology, perhaps to better adjust schedules, and also replacing some of the unnecessary 24-7 industry tasks, then we could be serving that population. Circadian rhythm in the last few years has really, I think, taken off. It has a long history, uh, but we're at a point now uh, where uh, there are a lot of opportunities for improving um, duration and quality of sleep and uh, better matching uh, sleep schedule to make sure people get it. Quick question about this. Um, when you say shift workers, is that people that are just working nights or overnights, or is it people who have to change their shift you know, every week? Yeah, some of the reporting on this is a little challenging because uh, often shifts do change. Even within a given individual, the pattern of that change may be altered. The Certainly the highest risk people are the people who are working night shift, and often those people are rotating between uh, night shift work and attempting to get daytime sleep to two on days that they're off, trying to sleep at night, and that pattern doesn't work very well. 
Uh, in particular, night shift workers, also rotating shift workers, particularly if the rotations are uh, done in some settings and in industry, you know, every four days is a change in shift. Those are the people that are greatest risk. Day shift workers, obviously, and even second shift workers who are well positioned within their natural sleep uh, cycle may do relatively well. Um, so uh, I, I think primarily it's the night shift workers. We do know and we have known for some time that that group, similar to what we talked about earlier with adolescents, are higher safety risks, um, they make errors, uh, they have higher accident rates, and they have significant medical risks related to their shift work. So what would be the solution for shift workers? I mean, if they can get onto a consistent shift, is that better than, I mean, that's better than the rotation, but um, yeah, the problem, I don't know, are there I any other the, ways to fix things? Yeah, well, I think that's what I'm getting at. That's where our science needs to take some steps forward. Uh, for instance, if you had a, neuro, if you had a pharmacological agent that allowed a, a quicker change and a more sustainable change in uh, circadian rhythm, then you could use that intervention to help manage people. We're, we're far from that, I think, at this point, but it seems conceivable since we have some interventions already. Alternatively, if you could identify people who have resilience to adapting to different changes or who have specific circadian tendencies. Uh, so as an example, in lay language, if you have people who tend to be night owls, uh, then they would probably be best placed in a second shift position. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's identify people who are best placed in specific shifts and then match them to those shifts. Let's be a little bit more careful about not rotating shifts. And let's identify people who are particularly uh, impaired and burdened uh, by their inability to adapt to change shifts and, and not put them into this risk category. So um, how we operationalize that, I think, is a question. How do you, do you use survey or biological markers to identify a certain tendency to be an, a lark or a, a night owl? And, um, and how do you identify uh, resilience to adaptability? We have some work in this area already, and I think we're a little ways from implementing it widely. Well, what kind of biomarkers would you look at to gauge the effectiveness of what's going on? Uh, well, um, you know, typically we, we can look at uh, activity pattern. Um, we have uh, melatonin measures that uh, can be used to identify circadian rhythm. I don't think they're in a, uh, in a very practical way. Uh, we don't have um, easy measures of, of biomarkers. Uh, there are some Genetics, I'm not working in a specific area, but there are some uh, genetic predictors of resilience that might eventually reach a point of being in practical use to allow us to determine who's perhaps at risk and who's not at risk uh, for shift work. Um, the science behind all of this moving forward, I think, will make our lives a lot easier. There's a little fear of getting information, I think, and it has to be done ethically uh, about individuals that predicts cancer or predicts uh, inability to work at a given shift. And so we have to be sensitive to the ethics uh, in applying the information. Well, what would be the ethics if uh, you were studying people and you were looking at X number of biomarkers and for some reason you think you were able to see that they had a higher increased risk of cancer? Or it be that well, you can, did have cancer. Like, how would you figure that out, and what would be the ethical dilemma of it? Yeah, I'm not sure I have the answer to that, except to say you could imagine that if, if an employer had information that would indicate that mm. somebody should or shouldn't be working at a shift, they would make an employment decision based on that, either when they would work or whether they're even employed. And so there's a, you know, I, I think the, the information is in the hands of the patient and they can make the decision or the individual uh, in conjunction perhaps with their provider uh, that might be better placed um, ethically in terms of managing them. Okay, gotcha. Or at least kept private so that, uh, yeah. you know, anonymized, the data would be anonymized to be, uh, you know, to be displayed in a study, and then it would be kept private, I guess, according to HIPAA, you know, for the individual itself. Right. For themselves. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, any interesting studies on sleep that you've, uh, that are in progress right now that you're monitoring and tracking or uh, ones that you've conceived of that you'd like to do that maybe haven't been done? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in some of these no-touch uh, approaches. They're, they're diverse. Uh, a few early reports uh, in children sometimes, and, and then some adults, it's difficult to use uh, 
direct touch monitoring. Um, and so the, uh, the, the uh, potential for that is quite diverse. It might include the use of chips uh, that are placed subcutaneously uh, that can be used to monitor diverse physiologic measures, including potentially even sleep or at least activity measures, all the way to external devices. For instance, say radar has been recently uh, used to identify movement. Uh, perhaps that could be used to pick up physiologic uh, measures uh, and detect sleep without the need for direct uh, contact in those in whom it's rather difficult to, to have a direct contact. So there's some, uh, some interesting diagnostic uh, potential there, I think. Any correlation of um, conditions that uh, you know, are pretty prevalent today, let's say diabetes, and how that correlates with what it does to their sleep or you know, uh, obesity? Cancer, yeah, I think we're, have, have, is there a field where people are looking at medical conditions and then looking at the sleep of the people that have them and seeing what, how it, that's affected? Yeah, well, I think the one that is perhaps the uh, greatest public health issue is related to weight gain and its impact on the development of diabetes and, and insulin resistance in people with insufficient sleep or with conditions such as sleep apnea or other conditions which interfere with the quality of sleep. And so, and there are increasingly, uh, probably even starting at an early age, there is an, a, a, there is evidence for um, insufficient sleep and uh, at least a longitudinal relationship with the development of obesity. Obesity is, it's of course disputed it, but there's a substantial mortality on a yearly basis related to, at least to the complications of weight gain, which has uh, exploded in our culture in the past 50 years or so. Um, and uh, so it's an important area of the intersection between sleep, uh, its duration, um, and its fragmentation, uh, and the impact on weight gain starting probably early in childhood um, all the way through adulthood. And so if we, um, I think the implication is if we can better manage sleep, it will at least have some um, impact on the issues we're having that are driving obesity. Some of them are related to sleep. Probably many more uh, are related to our culture and access to food, uh, which has evolved over the past 50 years or so. Okay. Well, very good. Any uh, Again, any particular uh, study that you'd like to, uh, to see done? Anything you want to elucidate? Well, uh, I think I alluded to a, a couple of areas. One would uh, it would be awfully nice for the area of research in neuropharmacology to to help us develop biomarkers for development of for predicting adaptability and resilience in the setting of shift work, and also for modifying the response to changes in shift or to altering the shift uh, circadian rhythm itself. That would be the amazing area, I think, to benefit our culture. Management of insomnia, you know, has moved up quite a bit in this country and in England in terms of guidelines uh, away from use of pharmacological agents. That's a, a very good uh, move. We need to probably tune that process better than what we're doing to make sure we can get cognitive and behavioral approaches uh, in, in integrated into uh, systems of care uh, so that we can better manage that very prevalent condition. And uh, I think in terms of uh, changing public health, I think the area, kind of interesting area of research that doesn't often come to us as sleep practitioners of uh, changing uh, attitudes <laughs> about uh, the importance and the biological imperative of sleep uh, and then implementing those changes in real world situations uh, have an opportunity to change uh, uh, health and sleep, both sleep health and public health in general quite a bit in this area. Do you feel like uh, societally we're going the right way in terms of our perception of sleep and the importance of it or is that yeah, more think education if look needed and we're sliding back? Yeah, I, I think we're in, you know we have fits and starts in every area of human progress, but I think there's been a continuous progress in uh, you know it's first uh, in this century in particular. Uh, I, I'm I'm sorry, in the last two centuries in particular, in the uh, development of the science of sleep that has really leveraged everything moving forward and um, and. Recently, in the past 50 years, I would say awareness of sleep and um, 
and the importance of sleep. Uh, perhaps one of the scarier things that's still kind of being tuned is uh, are the implications of um, impaired sleep fragmentation or insufficient sleep on cognitive function and its impact on neurodegenerative disease. Uh, that's an important issue because a substantial percentage of the population by the year 2050 is likely to have neurodegenerative disease. And if sleep, insufficient sleep is a driver for that, then what we're doing now is critically important in, um, in helping to manage that risk. So, um, so I guess those are, uh, but I think we're on the, you're asked, do I think we're on the right path? I'm just one person, of course. I think you would uh, survey people. Most people would agree that the field has been uh, strikingly progressive in the past uh, since its you know, development. Uh, it's a relatively young field of sleep science and sleep medicine. And um, a lot has happened in that time to make us aware of why it is a biological imperative and why it has a substantial impact on public health. Um, so I think we're moving in the right direction. Well, very good. So what's the best way for folks that are listening to find out more? Maybe get in contact, uh, you know, questions? Well, I, yeah, I, um, um, we are, I, this is a public program, I realize. Uh, so uh, we're just a metropolitan area here. We have our program, but there are our, our model programs around the country that uh, do clinical and basic science uh, research in different areas of sleep medicine. Uh, some are more basic science-based. Um, I think if the public is looking for specific information, um, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine offers, uh, and National Sleep Foundation, uh, both offer um, educational materials, uh, that are supportive uh, through their websites on um, general sleep health and sleep habits and sleep tip for both adolescents and for uh, adults. And um, within your locality, you can probably find sleep medicine practitioners who see pediatric sleep conditions. About 15% of kids will have and parents will have issues related often to sleep behaviors. And if you are looking for assistance as, as a patient, uh, I certainly would leverage the use of sleep medicine services, pediatric and adult in your area and probably recommend uh, that you approach those centers that are accredited if they have in, in sleep medicine and if they have um, specific areas of focus. There are certainly some that are much more focused on pediatric uh, sleep conditions than uh, you're having specific unusual behavioral problems with your child, uh, then you would probably want to seek one of those centers. Well, very good. Well, Dr. Iber, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and thank you for being here. All right. Thanks so much for inviting me. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.